Hi, everybody. Welcome to Shasai Podcast, conversations between scholars from around the world who study childhood, youth, and related institutions historically. As an official production of the Society for the History of Children and Youth, you can subscribe to these shows through iTunes or Google Play. Written and visual materials associated with each episode are available at our website, shcy.org. Enjoy. So welcome to this uh, Society for History of Children and Youth online magazine featured book series. Today we're going to have a conversation with Holly Doyle McAway on her book, Indigenous Children's Rights to Participate in Law and Policy Development, that was published uh, with Rutledge in 2022. Uh, so I'm really happy to have this conversation with you. I'd first like to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the unceded territories of the Ganyagahaga Nation, who are recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters. I'm also in Joe Jage, also known as Montreal, uh, which is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. And today it is a home to diverse populations of Indigenous and other people. I'm a professor at Concordia University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. I've been working for over 25 years in the area of children's rights and participation, youth engagement. I'm currently the principal investigator of the um, Indigenous stream of the uh, Quebec Youth Research and have the privilege of working as an ally alongside Indigenous youth organizations and community partners. And I also have the opportunity to work with Holly Doyle McAway um, as part of the International Canadian Child Rights uh, Partnership Initiative, of which we are co-leads of the policy um, working group. Um, so Holly, I just have a little bio that I wanted to uh, share so that everybody knows who you are and a little bit of your rich background. So Holly Doyle McAway has been working in children's rights for the last 25 years as a social worker, lawyer, and academic. She's currently an academic at the Macquarie University Law School in Sydney, and her research focuses on children's rights, law in particular, children's participation and protection rights, juvenile justice, girls' rights, and Indigenous children's rights. She teaches child law and constitutional law. She co-leads the Macquarie University Children's Research Network and is working on several major grant projects spanning five continents. She also plays an active role with the legal profession across the Asia Pacific region in her role as the expert counselor for children, Indigenous people, and gender. Before becoming an academic, Holly worked as a social worker with women and children who had experienced domestic violence and sexual abuse, and then pursued a career as a lawyer working across more than 20 countries for the United Nations and various international non-governmental organizations. So I have the pleasure of um, introducing her book um, that she has um, recently published. Um, here's a copy of the book. Um, I hope you can see it clearly. Um, and just to give you an idea before we engage in a conversation, some questions that we'd like to exchange around, um, I'd like to share some, um, some thoughts from Professor Laura Lundy, who's co-director at the Center for Children's Rights at Queen University Belfast, who reviewed the book. And so she quotes, this book being a much needed book for many reasons, most of all because of the resounding call for action it contains. This call for action comes directly from Aboriginal children and young people themselves, who through field research Dr. Doa McAway undertook for this book. Ask, and what she asked is the Australian government to listen to them, to take them seriously, and to stop making laws about them without them. Chapter after chapter, it calls on governments to reconceptualize their relationship with young Indigenous peoples and engage them in the design of laws and policies affecting them. This book is internationally relevant because the call to enact children's participatory rights reverberates across many nations, countries where governments continue to ignore or silence children's experiences and perspectives. Importantly, this book represents a child rights-based model for the participation of Indigenous children 
in decision making and offers practical ways of public officials can implement the participatory rights contained in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And as somebody who's worked in the field myself for many years, I really welcome this book very much and had the opportunity to review it in the International Journal for Children's Rights. And um, I'd like to draw upon some of those reflections that I had to ask some questions to Holly so that we can learn more about um, the significance um, of this book. So um, before we start, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself and your career in, in children's rights. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Natasha, for that um, lovely introduction and for your, for your kind and generous um, comments. Uh, look, I'd like to acknowledge first that I live and I work on Darug land, um, and that is land belonging to the Wallamadigal peoples. And, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also acknowledge that as a child rights lawyer, that um, Aboriginal people have been nurturing and growing up children on this land since the beginning. And um, as, a, as a person involved in um, predominantly Western law and the teaching of predominantly Western law, I acknowledge my role in a system that has perpetuated abuse against Aboriginal children um, for many, many, many decades. And, um, and and I would like to state my commitment to addressing that in the way that I teach and the way that I research. So um, thank you again, Natasha. Look, uh, in terms of uh, background um, and, and my career and, um, and my work in children's rights, I've come to academia in, the, in a kind of circuitous route. I started life as a, as a professional, as a social worker, and I predominantly worked with children and young people who had experienced sexual abuse. And I also uh, worked with uh, women who had experienced domestic violence. And so I did um, play therapies with children and um, I engaged in, in um, uh, you know, I was privileged to engage in some really wonderful um, therapeutic engagements with children and young people to help them heal from um, horrific things that had happened to them. And, and I loved that work. Um, and as a, as a consequence of engaging in that work, I thought about well, what, what can I also do um, to, to help um, uh, with addressing violence against children and women. And, um, and I thought becoming a, a lawyer would be a great way to do that. And, um, and I thought that I might be a barrister and that I might, um, you know, uh, take uh, action um, in terms of uh, trying to achieve damages for, for women and children who had experienced these abuses. Uh, I didn't end up becoming a barrister. Instead, I, I took a position at UNICEF in the Pacific. And uh, this was shortly after becoming a lawyer and, and I ended up um, becoming really well versed in the Convention on the Rights of the Child and, and um, worked with uh, small island states across the Pacific and um, assisted in the development of legislative provisions to embed the Convention on the Rights of the Child into, um, into domestic legislation, as well as lots of advocacy work. And so that started me on this, um, on this process of understanding the importance of the implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child in domestic contexts. And whilst the Convention on the Rights of the Child has uh, a lot of problems associated with perhaps its drafting and some of the text, I'm still very um, firmly committed to its implementation um, across the world. And I believe it's the, the best way forward for the implementation of children's rights. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that, perhaps as you ask me more questions. Um, so yes, that's how I came to um, doing children's rights work. Essentially, I've been doing children's rights work since the beginning of my professional career as a social worker and now as a, and as a lawyer and now as an academic. Um, but it's always working at that nexus between social work and law. Uh, and, and I've had the opportunity to work in a lot of INGOs, um, UNICEF as well as Save the Children, World Vision Plan, um, and as a consultant doing 
um, work across uh, many different nations around children's rights. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. I'm learning a lot about you. <laughs> you have a very rich history. So, so yeah, can you tell us a little bit about the intellectual journey or inspiration that led you to write um, this book, Indigenous Children's Rights to Participate in Law and Policy Development? Yes, well, there was a period of time where I was living and working in the Solomon Islands and um, that was when I was working for UNICEF and um, and I was uh, stationed in the Solomon Islands for a, a short period of time, a couple of months. And I was there at a time where uh, Ramsey was operating and that was the regional assistance mission to the Solomon Islands, which was led predominantly by Australia. and. And I noticed this interventionist style of work. There were, you know, uh, 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 land cruisers, white land cruisers all over the Solomon Islands, all over Honiara with expats in these land cruisers doing their development work. Now, I don't want to diminish development work, but it, it was uh, resoundingly clear to me as a relatively young um, and inexperienced lawyer that um, this uh, dichotomy between expatriates and local peoples was uh, a stark imbalance and it set up social structures of inequality. There were certain places where the expats were only allowed to um, B, in a sense, um, there was shipping containers brought in with food for expats um, to carry out the um, uh, regional assistance mission to the Solomon Islands. So it wasn't embedding into the community, um, expatriates within the community. And I started to think about the way international development is rolled out. And I started to really question um, interventionist style policy and law. And I didn't see a lot of um, benefits for the local women, essentially. And, um, and I'm sure there were some, but I, as an outsider, I was looking at this interventionist policy and questioning it from a rights-based perspective. And many others have done this too. Um, I don't want to diminish the regional assistance mission to the Solomon Islands, but there is a lot of literature that suggests that it was problematic in a, in a range of ways. And then I thought about later on when I was a, a manager at a child protection policy unit at, I think, the world's largest child protection institution, the Department of Community Services in New South Wales. It's a large organisation that um, I was in charge of developing policy at that time in that organization to protect children from abuse. And at that time, I was asked to um, provide comments about the recent Northern Territory emergency response in 2007, and whether we should be rolling some of the um, reforms in inverted commas out across the rest of Australia. And these reforms in inverted commas, which I don't think are reforms, which were interventionist style policies, very similar to what I was I had seen in previous years in the Solomon Islands, were ways to control and to um, manage manage the income of Aboriginal peoples in Australia, particularly in the Northern Territory, when the Northern Territory emergency response commenced in 2007. And I thought, this is problematic. This is exactly what I saw happen in the Solomon Islands. So that led me to think about perhaps doing a project that compared the regional assistance mission in the Solomon Islands with the Northern Territory intervention in Australia. Um, for a PhD project that was too big and my advisors said, no, pick one, one or the other. And so I picked Australia and I looked at the Northern Territory emergency response. And that is the field research that is the basis of the book. So that's the, the long answer. Oh, fascinating <laughs> that how those links across the globe and the link. So yeah. in my review of your book um, this year that just appeared at the International Journal for Children's Rights, I note that there's a growing recognition that implementing child rights to participation requires a renewal in approach. And that's been um, said by a number of uh, authors in children's rights, um, Kate Titstall and so on. Um, and I commented that your book is, is welcome, uh, providing a fresh ideas and why and how Indigenous children can be involved in policy making. So I'm wondering if you could just give us a few highlights
highlights of some of the key contributions um, that your book makes? Thank you for that review and, and that comment, um, Natasha. Uh, the, the key contributions that my book makes are uh, that it is the first account of Aboriginal children and young people's views about the Northern Territory intervention. Up until the publication of my book, there was one sentence that I could find in one of the reports, um, the alternate reports from Australia to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. One sentence from uh, an Aboriginal young person about the intervention. This book provides a, um, a, a large body of um, documentation about what Aboriginal young people think about the intervention. So it is the first um, comprehensive commentary on young Aboriginal people's views about the intervention. So that I believe is a very significant contribution and aligns with um, a child rights based approach to uh, knowledge creation and um, it also aligns with Indigenous research methodologies around who is in charge of knowledge creation, whose views get to be um, recorded in the academy and so often Aboriginal children and young people's views do not get recorded and um, so that is in my view a very significant contribution that this book makes. The second contribution I believe that is significant is that the theoretical approach that was used in the book um, one that combines a child rights based approach and Indigenous research methodologies was the first time I believe this has ever been uh, implemented in field research and at a doctrinal level as well. So that I believe is a very unique contribution that the book makes is so often we're thinking about research methodologies that don't actually incorporate Indigenous and marginalised young people within those frameworks. So that I believe is a significant advance um, in terms of knowledge creation uh, with respect to theoretical approaches to engaging children and young people, particularly Indigenous children in research processes. And I believe that will go further than just research processes because the model I've developed um, with the help of young people who were involved in this research can apply to many different contexts. To any context where, say, civil society want to engage with Aboriginal children and young people and hear their views with governments. So there's many different applications. And the, uh, the third um, contribution that I believe the book makes is the fusion of the Convention on the Rights of the Child with um, UN DRIP, particularly the participatory rights provided for um, in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 12 but also in Article 19 of the UN DRIP, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, that requires governments to consult with Aboriginal peoples prior to legislative or policy determinations being made. So that is a, a unique fusion of those two international human rights law instruments. Um, and it presents a new model for how young Indigenous people can participate in decision-making processes. So it's about uh, Aboriginal young people's participation in public decision making and, and I believe that is a unique contribution to um, knowledge in, in the academy. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's like a wonderful summary and very inspiring for those who are going to read this book and use this book. Um, child rights scholar Professor John Tobin in his endorsement of your book commented around in line with some of the things you just said that in a, the, on your innovative fusion of child rights scholarship with indigenous research methodologies to create a model for enabling effective and ethical participatory research with indigenous children uh, which will have enduring effect um, so can you talk a little bit more about this model uh, for indigenous and young people's participation in public decision making sure natasha I will share a um, page from the book that Great. depicts the model visually. That would be amazing. Can you see that model? Yeah, um, that's yeah. great. And colored too. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so the, the model is um, comprised of these five elements. And uh, these are the elements that I believe are uh, necessary in order for Indigenous young people to participate in a meaningful, but also culturally safe way with respect to public decision making. So the first uh, 
step uh, element is that those seeking the views of young Indigenous peoples about any given matter need to adopt a child rights based approach to doing that. So that means adopting the, the main tenets of children's rights. That is that young, young people have the right to be heard, not just the right to be heard, as Laura Lundy says, but the right to be taken seriously about matters that affect them. So it's more than voice. It's more than having the opportunity to sit in a room or be in an in a open space and present views. It's about having an opportunity to have those views make a difference in participatory processes and in public decision making. So it's, mm -hmm. it's taking the view that young people have agency. They are not mini humans with mini human rights, as, um, as Michael Freeman has famously said. Um, that young people uh, have indivisible, inalienable rights um, provided for by not only the Convention on the Rights of the Child, but the body of international human rights law more broadly. Um, so this is a rejection of, um, of welfarist-based notions of children, and um, it's an adoption of a rights-based approach to um, childhood and to um, engaging children and young people in participatory processes. There's a lot more to say about that, but I'll, I'll keep it brief. Element two is about addressing ethical considerations and consulting with communities in a ethical and um, appropriate way. This was a really huge part of um, doing this uh, field work. This took uh, a very long time to um, think carefully about, to seek the appropriate ethical approval uh, and to make sure that the research was done in a way that respected not only young Aboriginal people's status as young people, but their status as Indigenous young people, as the rightful owners of the land on which we occupy. And, um, and to also acknowledge ongoing invasion practices that dispossess Aboriginal people, not only of land, but of culture, of family and um, and so th that was a, that is a really important element of this framework is to address ethical considerations and consult with communities don't go into a community and, and request to speak with children and young people until you've sought the appropriate permissions from elders from any particular um, body that you need to approach before um, going in and speaking with children and young people uh, to make sure you undertake preparatory activities with children and young people and seek appropriate informed, prior informed consent. So this is not about this fly in, fly out model if we're thinking about outsider research. Um, and I was an outsider to the community in which I was doing, doing this research. So I, I am not an Aboriginal person and um, that has a range of very significant factors that we need to take into consideration. So to, uh, I guess, uh, ameliorate the, um, the problems associated with being a non-Indigenous person, doing research in an Indigenous community, uh, part of my um, panel of supervisors, um, we made sure that uh, I had Indigenous advisors and a reference group to um, monitor the work that I was doing and um, to make sure that this was done in an appropriate fashion. And um, so preparatory activities, for example, I would go and spend time in the school that I did the research at and, and, and participate in school life. I, it wasn't about going in and directly asking questions, um, or actually I didn't ask questions, directly doing research and yarning with children and young people. It was about um, positioning myself as somebody who was interested in that community and learning about that community and participating and contributing to that community before I sought to do research. So building rapport with children and young people and the, and the school that I was working at and the school council and the community at large. And there's many other factors at play there too, but um, for the sake of brevity, um, I, I will, I will um, stop there. But in terms of seeking consent, this is a really important issue with children and young people being involved in research. Uh, I sought consent not only from the children and young people, but from their parents as well, unless the child or young person was of such an age that it was appropriate for um, me not to um, seek consent from their, from their families. But there was no, no person um, who was approaching an age at which I wouldn't do that. 
Um, uh, so they were all quite young people. So um, the community was very involved and families were very involved in the consent process. And um, in fact, Aboriginal research assistants did that um, consent seeking on my behalf because it, it wasn't appropriate for me to go into community. I was only located at the school. It wasn't appropriate for me to go into community and ask um, in the um, local community for consent. So an uh, Aboriginal research assistant did that on my behalf and explained to each family the process. Um, element four is to seek children's views in a safe, child-friendly and culturally appropriate way. And so that means making sure that we're not um, uh, asking children and young people to go to inappropriate places or places that are not safe or that are overly formal or inappropriate in any given way. So, for example, this research was conducted usually in an open space, um, usually on the ground um, and usually using uh, a lot of different materials that were of interest for children and young people, including technology including the taking of iPads to engage children and young people in, um, I, I guess, technology focused research that they were very interested in taking their own photos um, of one another doing this research using recording functions to record their views. Um, and then I would transcribe it and, and also to make it fun. Um, many scholars have written about don't engage children in research unless you're going to make it fun for them. Otherwise, what's in it for them? And um, and so um, as a as a previous child um, counsellor and somebody who used play therapies with children and young people, I could really merge that um, experience with field research and and make it a really enjoyable part of um, their experience is certainly what children and young people told me. I'm sure there's ways that I could improve that and I'm, I'm always looking to do that. Um, in my in my ongoing research activities. And finally, um, element five is to make sure young people benefit from these um, engagements and to make sure you pay back that there must be a form of reciprocity that um, young people need to um, be uh, acknowledged for the work that they are doing. This is work. This is um, knowledge production and it is engagement in um, research it doesn't come without effort. And so to do things, even if they are um, uh, things such as providing food or providing a final party uh, where there is a barbecue or whatever it might be for the community, for the families, um, to acknowledge the work of the children and young people. Or, uh, for instance, I, I made a, a movie of all of the iPad recordings with the permission of the children and their communities and families. And then we watched the movie and had a movie um, afternoon with a barbecue, for example. Um, and then also providing the, um, the research back to the community. Um, I'll stop sharing now. Um, and oh, so, yeah, 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 the five elements, Natasha, that, um, that um, the model is comprised of. Um, and the book goes into a lot more detail about that. Yeah, no, so your chapter six, I think, is kind of like the heart of the book. Uh, well, that's a piece that I really could relate to a lot. And I think it's amazing how you um, present them and bring them to life and the applications of them for other, others, other scholars, other countries around the world. So can you talk to us a little bit about how do you see the application of this mo model um, in Australia or globally? Yes, absolutely. I, I guess that the, the fact that the model is informed by two uh, previously quite distinct areas of thinking, um, Indigenous research methodologies in, in emerging from Indigenous studies and international human rights law with a focus on children and indi Indigenous people's rights contained in the CRC and the UN DRIP. So these, this kind of blend of these two approaches um, is something that I believe lends the model um, to being applied in a range of different ways. Um, so not only in the way that I envisage with regards to children and young people's participation in legislative design or policy design or matters that affect children and young people and asking children and young people about their views about that. For instance, if we asked in Australia, Aboriginal children and young people's views about the incarceration of Aboriginal children, we would have a fundamentally different body of knowledge about that. Mm -hmm. um, but very rarely are Aboriginal children and young people asked about that. 
Likewise, very rarely are children asked about out of home care and the removal of Aboriginal children from country and from home and from family. So this model is really useful to gather previously unknown information. Now, I might note that this information is not unknown because it just hasn't been researched yet. This is unknown, well, there's a lot of knowledge about the impact of Aboriginal, uh, of removal of Aboriginal people from um, country and from land and from family, but rarely do we actually see the words of children and young people themselves in, in literature. Um, so if we did start doing that, there would be, a, hopefully, that, that could instigate some change at a, a very fundamental level. And I think that this is relevant in many other contexts, not just legislatively and in terms of um, policy around education, policy around health contexts, um, useful in terms of civil societies, um, engagement with Aboriginal children and young people, which is increasing in Australia, but also internationally. Uh, this is a model that doesn't just apply to Aboriginal children in Australia, but Indigenous children globally are, Generally, people who don't have the opportunity to have their voices heard and then taken notice of in many different contexts. So I think that this model is something that is uh, relevant, not just in Australia, but globally for children um, and not even only for Indigenous children. This model, as, as I showed on the screen, is, is a model that if implemented for all children's participation activities would be very useful for all children. Um, Professor Susan Page, an Indigenous scholar, commented um, that in your book, the voices of Aboriginal children and young people ring clear and true. She said you adroitly, adroitly <laughs> sketched the relevant legal and policy making mechanisms and that you never lost sight of the children whose capacity to speak is abundantly evident. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, how you achieve that and um, working as an ally um, in Indigenous communities. Um, what did you learn? Are there some learnings that would be uh, that you could share with us? Mm. I, I think allyship is a, a very uh, difficult and contested area. And perhaps had I known now, um, then what I know now, uh, I may not have attempted this research. Uh, and the reasons I may not have attempted this research, and certainly perhaps not in the, uh, in the way that it was done, because I believe that a, a research such as this is of such importance that we need teams of Indigenous scholars and researchers and activists and um, you know, professionals in the area to do this kind of important work. And the fact that I'm non-Indigenous, I can't quite overcome that as a um, key barrier to doing um, this kind of work with Aboriginal young people. The work that I've done since this project has always involved uh, and always will involve people who are insiders to the community in which um, the research will take place. And I believe that's a more ethical way to go about doing field research engaging Aboriginal children in that. Um, so uh, as a process of reflecting on my own work, I, I think that as part of this, this project was part of a PhD um, field research project. And the very nature of that PhD program is it's quite a colonialist structure. It's mm -hmm. a individual researcher trying to get their PhD and, and you apply to ethics committees. I applied to a couple um, and that took almost half of my candidature to um, receive uh, um, endorsement to go ahead and, and do this. Such was the, um, the scope of the research. And, um, and I guess in hindsight, perhaps I should have done a more doctrinal analysis for my PhD. And then when um, it is no longer a PhD program and there is a body of funding perhaps that I could have applied for to do this, then go and do this work with children and young people, which may in fact have meant that I didn't have any contact with children and young people. Um, that's, that, was, that work perhaps would have been um, solely done by um, perhaps research assistants or other collaborators. 
Uh, now, I don't want to undermine the work, but I want to be really honest about the limitations of the work. And mm -hmm. my non-Indigenous status is a huge limitation of the work. And um, I've tried to overcome that in various ways, but ultimately, I think the history of um, Western research where Indigenous peoples are not part of the research process and, um, and kind of studied upon rather than with um, is something that I tried to overcome and somewhat did in this research. But uh, in the research I've done more recently in Nepal, for example, and the research I've done with Indigenous young people around treaty in Australia, for example, that was done in a context where there is a team of people, including Indigenous peoples, doing that research. So, yes, I just want to be really open about that. And, and I think that non-Indigenous scholars working in this space should be. And, um, and I think that that is something that we need to accept as a problem in the academy, that so often research has been done about and on Indigenous people rather than with. So that is one of the, the key problems, I believe, that is associated and the limitations associated with this research. It doesn't nullify the research, but it certainly is a, a factor that everyone needs to consider prior to doing research like this. And so that's my key learning, I believe. Um, but I also learned that children and young people, Indigenous children and young people in remote areas want to be listened to, want to be asked. And um, they told me that this was the first time they had been asked about matters of law, about matters of policy, despite the fact that they're subjected to this intervention on a daily basis, but never been asked about it. So yeah in summary that is my my response to your question and of course there are many other um learnings that i could share but i think that's one of the most important um learnings that came from this well i really appreciate your your honesty and transparency around some of this challenge of being being an ally and i i, I do um your point around learning to in the future, you would work in community with community. I think that seems to be like a key takeaway of work as a, as a team. Um, but the structure of the PhD is very individual based and that, that's definitely a challenge and I think something to, to reflect on more deeply um, in our academia generally. Um, so this book is extremely well referenced. I mean, um, it's like amazing, like sometimes half the page is references. Um, and uh, Professor Sharon Bessel uh, describes it as meticulously researched and said this book represents one of the few studies of Aboriginal children's participation in Australia and makes an extraordinary contribution to both the conceptualization and practice of participation. Can you tell us about some of the key scholars um, that helped frame your research? Absolutely. Um, John Tobin was one of the adjunct supervisors of the project, and his work was the first work that really influenced um, me around this project. I had known him prior to that um, from seeing him at various child rights conferences, and I, but I wasn't deeply familiar with his writing, um, more his verbal presentations, and so. I, I took a deep dive into his work and that is very formative and um, still um, plays a very key role in, in my research today. He told me about Laura Lundy and um, then I took a deep dive into her work and uh, that, that was a key uh, learning for me, her article Voice is Not Enough, a really key learning in terms of um, reframing my ideas that I had held so long about children and participation and voice that the she really took apart Article 12 and helped me understand the, the um, legal meaning and dimensions of Article 12 and around her space, voice, audience and influence. That was really helpful. Another key scholar, um, Matthias Corderoy Arce, um, also really helped me understand um, critiques of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Whilst I don't necessarily agree um, wholeheartedly with all of his critiques, he talks about the paternalism embedded in the Convention on the Rights of the Child and some of the um, uh, problems he perceives as, um, as uh, within the text um, that have been generated around inadequate consultation with children in the drafting process. But he also, in his writing and his critique of the convention, he helped me confirm my view of the value of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. 
Um, and that's contrary to his writing, but I, I was kind of thinking, well, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, we need to have an instrument that is um, that we can use. And I think from the convention of the Committee on the Rights of the Child, the general comments um, keep the, the convention alive. And so that I think is a, a good way that in the absence of textual change, of the convention, we can we can still um, uh, achieve direction on implementation of that. But Martin Nakata uh, and his daughter Sana Nakata uh, and his um, standpoint theory, where he talks about uh, it's not just about a achieving the the views and seeking the views of um, of young people. He actually doesn't talk about young people. He talks about indigenous peoples more broadly. He's saying it's about um, marginalized voices and including marginalized voices in the academy and recording those voices um, as, a, um, as a really important contribution to knowledge production. And then he talks about, uh, you know, knowledge production, who gets to do this, who doesn't. So that was really fundamental. And then Sana Nakata's work on Indigenous childhoods was also really fundamental. I looked at um, Lester Irabana Rigney's work around cross-cultural um, research with Indigenous peoples and, um, and his writing about how historically Aboriginal peoples have been the subjects of research rather than participants in control of the processes, methods and interpretation of data. And then Lana Ray's work um, around um, uh, uh, kind of decolonizing um, research was also fundamentally helpful. Uh, and, her, and, and Lana's work around establishing equitable relationships with the state. So um, a lot of Indigenous scholars have informed this work, but Linda, Linda Tuvi Y. Smith and her book on decolonizing methodologies and her writing on insider and outsider research was very important in framing this research. And I still refer to her book regularly in all of the research that I do. So yeah, they're some of the key authors, but there are so many. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful array of, of very different authors and that you bring together and I think it's really framed, um, explained the uniqueness also of your book and um, the approach put forward. Um, so in the context of Australia and current policy of, of assimilation and welfare-based policies, how has your book been received? Well, um, it's hard to know. Uh, how the book is being received um, and and I guess that in the context of what's happening in Australia now with respect to Aboriginal children and young people and Aboriginal people um, of all ages uh, it's not a very good climate at the moment it's a it's a, an environment where in the first um, chapter of the book I write about demanding Aboriginal children's rights because I argue there is an absence of rights in, in Australia uh, with respect to Aboriginal children and young people. And the first chapter of the book is framed around um, the torture of Aboriginal children in a detention centre called Dondale in the Northern Territory of Australia. And this was propelled into um, a kind of national consciousness in 2016 when an investigative journalist, Caro Meldrum Hanna, um, uh, showed secret footage that had been recorded in Dondale of the torture of young people in detention. Now, this was widely known to be the case across, not just in the Northern Territory, but across many detention centres in Australia. But never before had Australian um, people seen footage to um, demonstrate the um, horrendousness of the torture of Aboriginal children, tear gassing and really, really terrible treatment of Aboriginal children that constitutes torture, um, absolutely, under international human rights law. It instigated a royal commission um, and very few of those recommendations have been actioned. Dondale isn't closed, nor is uh, other uh, institutions that have committed similar heinous crimes against um, Aboriginal children as young as 10. So we have a very low age of criminal responsibility across all jurisdictions in Australia, and it is 10. And Aboriginal children as young as 10 are being uh, incarcerated. And it's usually Aboriginal children. Um, it's generally not non-Aboriginal children who are being incarcerated at such a young age. So there, are, there is a very active movement to change and high, high, um, make higher the age of criminal responsibility in Australia 
uh, and the ACT is looking like that hopefully will occur the Australian Capital Territory soon. We don't know, but soon. So I think that in answer to your question, um, how has the book been received? Um, well, I, I, I hope that in the future it will be read and um, perhaps make a difference when we have a climate where uh, Australian politics is prepared to listen to Aboriginal people. And there are some hopeful signs that that will occur. Our new Prime Minister, uh, Anthony Albanese, in his victory speech um, this year, uh, when uh, he became Prime Minister, his first mention in his speech was that we need to acknowledge Aboriginal people in our constitution. And it's looking like that may occur, we're not sure when, um, but there is opposition to that. Um, but at least there is political will to move forward on that at the moment. So I think that in order for the book to be received well, we need a, a, a culture change and a political change and social change in order for the recommendations that the book puts forward to um, be able to be implemented um, in a, a real way. Um, and we need to fundamentally reconceptualize um, childhood and Aboriginal um, children and their place in society. Um, and apart from welfareist notions of childhood that position Aboriginal children as, as I've said before, Freemans, many humans with many human rights. So. so what is your hope for the impact of the book? Look, I hope that the, the um, research um, presented in the book will promote legal and social recognition of Aboriginal children and young people and Aboriginal people more broadly. And I hope that that will come in the form of a treaty. I hope that um, Australia will enter into um, uh, bona fide uh, conversations and discussions with Aboriginal people from all over the country, which is already happening in several states, and, um, and design a, a treaty or treaties that acknowledge Aboriginal peoples as the first peoples of this land. And I hope that we can, through that, um, uh, make recompense and perhaps have a, um, a, a, you know, a, a system that legally recognises Indigenous um, dispossession and, um, and legally recognises that we need to make good and we need to not only recognise, but we need to come to a point where sorry doesn't mean just saying the word. Sorry means paying the rent um, for stolen land, sorry means um, stop incarcerating children and young people, stop taking children and young people from their families, from their country and putting them into either the child protection system or the juvenile justice system, which generally um, is, is what is happening. Children and young people, Aboriginal children and young people are being taken from country today more than ever and that needs to stop. So I hope that the impact of this book will be that it provides an evidence base to listen to children and young people and to take their views on seriously and end assimilationist policies that dispossess and continue to support the removal of children, Aboriginal children and young people from family and from country. So it's a big undertaking. Um, how do you see yourself building on this work in the future? Well, I have already started to build on this work um, as a logical extension of this project. I have um, with an Aboriginal colleague from the Australian National University, Biami Williamson. We have just recently finished conducting field research with Aboriginal young people about their vision for treaty and about their vision for agreement making with the state. Uh, and about their, their hopes and for what a treaty could bring about. Uh, and not, um, I mean, not all um, young people necessarily um, had the same view, of course, about treaty and about agreement making. And some young people spoke about sovereignty as being the focus for them and, um, and questioned the position of treaty with respect to sovereignty and and um so that's that was some really interesting findings that came out of that research i'm also working on a project and i finished research in nepal with um with 
boys and girls, um, but young people in Nepal and looking at girls' participation in domestic measures to end male violence against girls. So I heard from boys and girls about measures to do that and how girls could play a role in, um, in uh, legislative and policy um, measures to end male violence, which is a very big problem with respect to girls in, um, in Nepal, as it is across many, many countries, indeed all. And of course, I'm, I'm working with you, Natasha, um, on the Canadian Child Rights Partnership. And we're doing that work over seven years. And um, that gives us a wonderful opportunity to continue uh, to do um, work around promoting the Convention on the Rights of the Child and its implementation, particularly children's participatory rights. So I hope this will lead to many, many different projects. It's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for uh, giving us such a rich uh, conversation background on the contributions um, and where this book came from and, and, and the journey that you went through. Um, so I want to remind everybody um, to get this book, Indigenous Children's Rights to Participate in Law, Policy and Development. Um, I want to say, I think the impact, you talked a lot about the impact in Australia, but I think around for Indigenous people in other places of, of the world, um, this what's being put forward in the model of children's uh, participation is really val valuable um, and I feel it's a vital contribution to the goal of advancing Indigenous children's rights um, in Australia but also globally so thank you so much for doing this work and for continuing to do the work um, I look forward to collaborating and for other people to be collaborating and learning about the exciting work that you're doing so thank you very much Thank you so much, Natasha. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this interview with me today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Shusai Podcasts. You can find more materials and features from the Society for the History of Children and Youth online. shcy.org.